Welcome back to the show. I have NVK, founder of CoinKite, joining me again. Lots to talk about with re regards to security. So NVK, thanks so much for coming back on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. It's been a while. I know. I, I heard that you just came back from the Noster conference in Japan. How was that? That, that was a lot of fun. Tokyo is a blast. Oh, it's on my list. I really want to go. Um, okay. I know we have little time, a lot to talk about. So let's get right into it because there are a lot of concerns surrounding security. We've been hearing just these heartbreaking, devastating stories of people putting their seed phrases onto password managers and then poof, all of their Bitcoin is gone. So it's something we talk about a lot is self-custody, the importance of that, but also where you put your seed phrase is also critical. So can you talk a little bit about the lessons that we're learning from some of the anecdotes that are in the space? Yeah, I mean, we've we've been hearing this sort of like sad stories really for years until Hardware Wallets showed up, right? Uh, and uh, I mean, that specific person, they, they were pre-Hardware Wallets. They had not used one, so they had their seeds saved on the very secure um, password manager in the computer, right? Uh, and reality is, I mean, like computers are completely owned, right? I mean, like, you know, there's viruses, there's all kinds of issues with them. Um, they, they're very complex systems. They're not designed to hold mission critical secrets. So, um, you know, and unlike passwords, you can't roll back. You can't just change it, right? If somebody takes hold of your seed, the money's gone. Uh, so that's what happened in that case. Uh, he had his uh, his seed there, and uh, unfortunately, twenty six Bitcoin were gone. Um, I've talked to him on DMs, and uh, th there is a chance maybe that they managed to freeze. I think the funds went. The hacker sent the money to Binance or something. So, so there's still some hope here that uh, in, in this process somebody manages to recapture those coins. But yeah, it, it's very unfortunate. Uh, the lesson really here is use a hardware wallet, get yourself a cold card and uh, and uh, avoid all these this issues. Yeah. Well, so where is the best place to store a seed phrase? Because some people write it down like pen and paper, old fashioned, maybe put it in a safe. Um, others use the, the plates, right, where you can engrave it. And th some of those are amazing because you could literally like, you know, that on fire and uh, put it through a series of ballistic tests and, and nothing happens to it. So I kind of recommend looking into those, uh, but never in something where there's a password manager, even though you think that you're the only one with access to it, right? Like the last pass or key, I forgot the names of all of them, but a lot of people use these password managers. Yeah. So never on a computer period, not, never put your seed on any device that is not your hardware wallet. <laughs> and and, and and this is like, you get like uh, uh, orders of magnitude security by just not putting your seed on anything that's connected to the internet, right? Because if the device is connected to the internet, it means somebody could try to remotely take it from you, right? If it's on paper on your desk, I mean, it's very hard for a hacker to get to that. But paper burns mm -hmm. and paper gets wet and gets destroyed, right? So, so let's not use paper as your backup. Uh, you know, get a seed plate. You know, put your seed on the metal because you, you make a huge difference. And and you can put that on a safe somewhere and, and you're going to be, you know, like incredibly more secure than you were before. Now, you can improve that, right, adding a passphrase or, or doing multi-sig and some of the other things. But just basics, uh, just removing hackers and house fires from the equation, which is, you know, how most people likely go. Uh, having having the seed offline on metal in a safe and having a harder wallet on how you, that's how you handle the Bitcoining, right? Uh, I, I think you're already in like a fantastic place better than, you know, 99.9% of the people. Yes. Yeah. Never put it on the computer. I just heard <laughs> a story of someone emailing two seed phrases from yes. a multi-sig to their attorney because he wanted the attorney to, I'm like, Oh my gosh. And I'm sure we're going to hear more of these stories because Bitcoin is getting more and more attention now that the number is starting to creep up again, right? I'm sure, I'm sure your company is certainly getting more, more hits right now with people very, very interested. So what do you want people to know? Because self-custody is really important, but a lot of people still feel very intimidated. And so they might be in, encouraged to trust a custodian, a third party that's similar to their retail bank. Remember, not your keys, not your coins, right? So, um, you know, 
if you buy Bitcoin on an exchange and you leave it there, maybe they change regulation. They say, no, you can't take it out anymore. <laughs> you don't want to be in that position, right? I mean, you have the most pristine type of collateral ever invented by mankind. So take it off the exchanges. I know it's hard. It sounds scary. So the first thing you do is you download a phone wallet, okay? Uh, one that lets you create your own seed. And then you you send $100 worth of Bitcoin to that wallet. Then you try to spend it. You, you delete the wallet. You try to recover from seed backup. And you play around. And you become comfortable with it, right? Uh, now at least you understand how Bitcoin works. Then you go and you order yourself a cold card. And then you move the funds from the exchange to the cold card. But first, you send a little bit. You test your backups. You test spending. Once you're very comfortable, then you withdraw from the exchange into your cold card. Right? Is it a lot, lot of money? Maybe look into multisig. Maybe look into a collaborative multisig mm -hmm. setup or something. But the the idea is get comfortable. Uh, don't do things in a hurry. Move slow yeah. and don't break things. Yeah. But but don't sit on your ass either. Right? I mean, let's get the bitcoins off the exchanges. It helps your price too. Right? Because mm -hmm. we remove the amount of bitcoin available for spot by taking the bitcoins off the exchange. Yeah. So you actually make the price go up. Yeah. Well, NVK, we did sort of a deep dive on self-custody that I hope people will listen to. I've done a tutorial with uh, BTC Sessions on the cold card. I'm about to do another one with the air-gapped version. So I'm re really looking forward to that. But I had a question that I, I never asked you in our last interview, which is recording keystrokes. Someone mentioned that to me in a conversation, and it made me want to take out my tinfoil hat. I got really freaked out. Like, can these computers essentially record keystrokes? Like, when I log in, is someone potentially recording any of the information that I have to enter in order to access my Bitcoin at any point? And, and do you have any warnings about that? Absolutely. It happens all the time. I mean, one of the most common attacks is uh, what's called a keylogger. Right, so they will install remotely software on you either through a virus or through a malicious website or something. And now your computer is sending all your keystrokes to a remote attacker who now have a copy of your password, it has a copy of your, you know, whatever things you type in the chat. Uh, so yeah, so please be careful. Don't install things off the internet and uh, don't do Bitcoining from a computer that you, you, you do a lot of other things that maybe puts you at risk. So if you have, say, a hardware wallet attached to your computer, it can can it know and record what you're typing in to log no. into that? No. no. So, okay. I, I mean, there, there is different hardware wallets. Some are going to be less secure, and they're going to do whatever they do, right? I, I can only speak for cold card, and mm -hmm. on cold card, they can't do that. Uh, okay. It is fairly, fairly secure against that, uh, connected or not connected, because you can use it unconnected to the computer. Right. Uh, it, it's fairly secured against that. Uh, we also have this feature called uh, Keypad Scramble uh, in case you're concerned about cameras in your environment. Oh. Uh, so if they see you typing on the keypad, it's going to represent different numbers okay. than what you're typing. Uh, and then you, you, you can sort of remove some of those concerns too. That is awesome. Okay, well, before I ask you about some of the new products that are coming out, because I'm curious about them, coin mixers. Right now, there's a huge conversation about privacy, uh, the FinCEN legislation that is sort of threatening that area, but also this idea that if you use a coin mixer, that potentially your account could get locked up where you purchase your Bitcoin or where you're trying to withdraw from. What can you share about that and, and whether people should use those types of privacy tools? So privacy should be a human right. We can start with that. But unfortunately, regulators don't agree with that. Uh, so it, it's tricky, right? I, I mean, the technology is there, right? So you have Samurai, you have Wasabi, and there is Joy Markets. Those are the three major sort of solutions out there. Uh, they do work if they use correctly. Um, so basically, they, you send your Bitcoin to them, and then they spit out another uh, key that that makes that obscures which key is yours or which Bitcoin. Think about is it this way: If I had a bucket, okay, and everybody puts in one dollar bill right yep. and then i mix the bucket and then everybody takes a dollar bill out we don't know yep. whose dollar bill was that but everybody came out with a dollar bill got it right so we just mix the utxos together um i'm oversimplifying but uh essentially through statistical reverse analysis right mm -hmm. we can come up with a schema where that comes out uh, anonymized uh, the issue with all of them is um if you don't if you're not very careful on how you handle 
the coins on the outset, right? You can dox yourself again. <laughs> so it's very tricky. It's, uh, it's unfortunately, it's very advanced. Um, the best privacy right now is for people simply to not spam. <laughs> so if you don't spend, <laughs> nobody's going to know. Uh, that's one way of thinking about it. Uh, and, and these tools are improving. They are improving and they will get better, a lot better. Now, uh, some exchanges in some jurisdictions uh, will uh, block your account if you send to those addresses or if you receive from those addresses uh, because they are kind of known that they are in a mixer. They don't know. They can't unmix it. What they can mm -hmm. do is they just know that it's part of mixing. Right um, now, uh, if if I remember correctly, if you just send one hop in between, you're fine in most jurisdictions. Like that's where it gets tricky. You know, I, I'm not gonna give like legal advice or sort of like how to cheat sure. like regulations <laughs> or anything like that. But right. um, things are are very tricky, confusing, and unclear in that space. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that most people watching this, certainly myself included, we want to be compliant. We just want to be private and, and yes, privacy. Right. It just feels like it's constantly under threat. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about cold card because I, I have admitted on this show, I used to find that to be the most intimidating device before I actually used it. And now I realize how simple it is. I'm so glad we started a, a partnership. You guys are coming out with a new version of it that looks like the, um, I think it looks like a Blackberry with all of the numbers and, and alphabet. So what's the cold card queue? So uh, this is the cold card queue. Uh, not many people have seen it yet. Um, it's essentially a QWERTY uh, a keyboard uh, hardware wallet. Uh, it has batteries. It has NFC. It has a camera for QRs. And th the idea really was, or originally, I was just making a you know mountain man device, right? <laughs> like it's like you know we put our team foil hats, you know we pilgrimage mm -hmm. to the mountains, and we go to our Bitcoin in there. But it, it, it seemed like a lot of people were interested in this. So we sort of took the the, 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 the design a little bit further and sort of refined a little. So, um, so yeah, so, so that's where it's at now. We're just uh, uh, pre-selling them. We hope to ship them early next year. Um, and uh, the demand is quite high. They have a big screen, so it's boomer friendly. Um, <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> my friend Foss uh, can, use it, can use this one. I, I also heard that you guys have something called Sats Link, but I'm, I think it's going to be too techy for me. But in case anyone's interested, what is that? Yeah, so, so Sats Link, it's a, it's a bit nerdy. Um, it, it's uh, it's similar in design, but it's a very different electronics inside. Um, we we create it so that people can um, write interesting applications that are for freedom communication, for Bitcoin coordination, uh, and really experiment uh, having good hardware. Uh, we presented them at the Noster, Nostrasia conference cool. in Tokyo. Uh, there is a video on the Satslink device Twitter. Oh, perfect. Okay. Well, I'll link that in the show notes. Thank you so, so much, NVK. I really think this privacy and security conversation is so important, especially as more and more people start to look at Bitcoin over the coming months and year with the halving, with the ETF. So any final thoughts and messages you want to leave people with? Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I'm just going to say like, you know, it is intimidating to take self-custody, but that's the whole point of Bitcoin. You know, you you have two upsides. One is economical upside. The other one is freedom upside, right? Take both, please. Be your own bank. It's not that intimidating once you actually, you know, start driving the car. I was always, when I was 16, I was terrified of driving a car and I realized how easy it was. That's what uh, taking self-custody of Bitcoin's like. So NVK, thanks so much. Links are in the show notes. Thank you. Thank you so much for checking out the video version of my show. Remember, this podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Nothing constitutes as official investment advice, and you should always do your own research. Please reach out if you have guest suggestions or any feedback. My email is natalie at talkingbitcoin.com, and I'll see you next time.